Hello, I'm Ileana Pena. I'm the quality officer for cardiovascular line at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. And this is my blog. I really wanted to do this blog because there's two papers that I want to talk to you about, which I am really impressed at how well written they are and how well structured they are. And they both have to do with HEPPEP, with heart failure with reserved ejection fraction. And you have heard me before on this blog to talk about the growing number of patients with HEPPEP. And yet it is a difficult diagnosis. It's much easier to diagnose HEPREP because the ejection fraction is abnormal. And the patient usually has a history, whether it's hypertension or myocardial infarction, but this is different. And I think most of these patients are probably sitting in the primary care office. And in the primary care office, they may look like diabetics. They may look like obese patients that maybe they're short of breath because of their obesity. They may be looked as the hypertensive variety. Um, and yet, never bringing it out that this is really HEPREP. And what this paper does, which is actually a consensus document of experts talking about why are we seeing more of this, how to diagnose it, what are the things that mimic heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but are not, in fact, HEPF, and may have other causations. And so I think it's a beautiful roadmap for any clinician to look at this carefully and take a look at each and every item. The figures are also excellent. There are figures with these Venn-like diagrams that shows how the primary care specialist really is very key here at realizing that these symptoms of shortness of breath with exertion could in fact be HEPPEV and that go ahead and get that NT pro BMP because it's going to help you with the diagnosis. And of course, even more importantly, once you make that diagnosis, once you bring it all together, what drugs are you going to use? And there's another table that mimics our guidelines from the 2022 guidelines, but tells you to always think of the SGLT2 inhibitors first. These drugs really have revolutionized the care of FPEF. And then you can add other things like the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. Um, 25 milligrams a day is what's recommended. And then you may want to add either Secubitril, Valsartan, where I don't think the data are as strong because patients after that 57 mean of ejection fraction do not respond as well, or maybe a nature receptor blocker like candesartan, which was actually studied in the heart failure with reserved ejection fraction population. I also want you to remember that the definition by ejection fraction has changed. And a lot of these earlier trials looked at over 40 or over 45. And now in our new definition of heart failure, True HEFPEF begins at 50 or higher. So that's the first important distinction to be made is what ejection fraction are you looking at in this particular patient? And how are you going to fit that in with the data that we have from the studies? But certainly the SGLT2 inhibitor, and right now we have empagliflozin and dapagliflozin, and the guidelines really use it as a um, sort of a generic format. It's an SGLT2. They don't specify whether you want to use canagliflozin, sotagliflozin. There's many others coming out other than empagliflozin or dapagliflozin, which is what we have now in most of the formularies. And they are approved for this. Um, and the data are really solid. And, and the data have been incredibly consistent. But let me back backtrack a little bit about the diagnosis. There's a heavy emphasis right now on obesity and obesity linking inflammation and inflammation being very much at the core of the development of the HEPPEF syndrome. Inflammation, which includes things like IL-6, IL-1, CRP, which we've heard so much about in the coronary world about the inflammatory markers. Hey, we use statins. Statins have anti-inflammatory properties in the patients with coronary disease. A little bit different here. We haven't really tagged inflammation as a target, but I think we're starting to realize that maybe that's where the SGLT2 inhibitors are working. 
So take a look at obesity. It's a very important comorbidity in these patients. Try to rule out, do they have coronary disease? And are there symptoms related to coronary disease? Is there sleep apnea? Are these patients diabetic? And so the paper really highlights the very, very important findings of the comorbidities. And you may have a patient that has all of the above. It may be a diabetic who already is obese or definitely overweight at least, who has had hypertension for a while. Now you've got this confluence of these three comorbidities surrounding this diagnosis. And then finally, how are you going to detect what happens when the patient exercises? Because HEF-PEF symptoms are classically shortness of breath or fatigue or both with activity. And so as long as the patient is sitting okay, maybe their left atrial pressures look normal or nearly normal. But as soon as they start doing an activity, those pressures go up very high. What about maybe an exercise echocardiographer that can detect uh, measures of, of pressure in the left atrium while the patient is exercising? And then again, don't forget to use NT Pro BMP because that is part of the definition. You have to have a sign, other than the symptoms of shortness of breath with activity, you have to have at least one sign. And it may be an elevated NT Pro BMP or congestion. Can you detect congestion, high left atrial pressures, high pulmonary pressures, uh, the need for a uh, diuretic? These are all congestion signs that need to go along with it. Let me remind you that the NT Pro BMP levels in HEFPEF are usually lower than in HEFREF, but if you use the patient as their own um, baseline, and here's a new patient that you're seeing in the office, Get that NT Pro BMP on them in the office early while you're seeing them with those symptoms and then track them. If you're doing a therapy that's going to be beneficial, I bet you that NT Pro BMP will go down. And it should give you sort of a signal that you're going in the right direction and compare it to see how the patient feels as the NT Pro BMP goes down. So, this is really a clinical challenge. We're going to be seeing more of these patients. The population does have a lot of obesity out there. There are a lot of diabetics. Uh, it's becoming highly prevalent. And I think no matter what specialty you have, you're going to be seeing more of these patients. So this is in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, coming out this week with a companion paper written by Dr. Barry Borlaug from the Mayo Clinic, also beautifully defining the physiology and talking about exercise testing in this population. There are also some um, maybe thoughts about if you had a grading system so that uh, the, the symptoms may be a grade, and then uh, next to that could be the BMI, uh, could be the NT Pro BMP, and he talks about two different grading systems or, um, or sort of a formula to give you a number that detects or doesn't detect HEPF. Thank you for listening today. I hope you read both of these papers. Uh, I really, really like them. I'm, I'm very uh, enthusiastic about both of them. This is Ileana Pina signing off, and thank you for joining me today.